Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. The Lord be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. It is good to see you in this place as we gather here to worship and to celebrate with one another all that God is doing through the people at First Baptist Church. Let me draw your attention to just a few of the things you'll see on your bulletin insert, the list of activities coming up for the next few weeks. First glance, you see that it is a very busy two weeks ahead, as this full page indicates. Just a few schedule changes today, uh, some last minute time changes. First of all, um, the Sanctuary Choir and a few others out there will be rehearsing at 4 o'clock here in the Sanctuary today. Uh, the youth handbells, it was listed at 4.30, however, they're going to be here since many of them uh, have parents who are in the adult choir. They will be here also at 4 o'clock rehearsing in the chapel. And they'll get a, a few minutes extra rehearsal, so they'll be here at 4 instead of at 4.30. And youth choir will be uh, put back just a few minutes to about around 5.30. Uh, everything else on the, today's schedule is the same as printed. This Wednesday at 6 p.m., we will be having our monthly business meeting a couple of weeks early because of all the other activities during Holy Week and some other special events coming up. So this Wednesday, we will be having a covered dish fellowship and our monthly business meeting at 6 p.m. in our church fellowship hall. Next Sunday, the preschoolers and children will be meeting here at the church on the church grounds for uh, our Easter egg hunt. Uh, in the event of rain, we will be holding that in the gym. That will be next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Next Tuesday, we'll be taking our annual tr Dogwood Arts Festival trip. Uh, we invite you to call the church office uh, if you're interested in going to that. That's next Tuesday. We're leaving around 9 a.m. Our uh, special services next week as a part of Holy Week. Uh, next Sunday night, the adult choir will be presenting the cantata Hallelujah for the Cross by John W. Peterson. On Thursday evening, we will be having our Maundy Thursday uh, service, uh, service of darkness, service by candlelight. We want you to come and to join us for that special time of worship. And then on Friday, uh, April 14th, Good Friday, we will be having uh, our Good Friday luncheon and devotional service. It starts at 1130 and it will be over by 1245. Uh, if you have lunch during that time or can uh, work it in your schedule to be here, please join us for this community worship service. We would be delighted to see you there. It is a good day to be here, and it is good to see you in this place. We begin our worship now with a hymn that begins to help us turn our hearts and our minds to the ordinance of baptism. Hymn number 364, Come Holy Spirit, Dove Divine. We're going to sing the first three stanzas prior to the baptism. And then if you will, keep your hymnals open to that page. And immediately following the service of baptism, we will join together again and sing the fourth stanza of hymn 364.
join me in our baptismal commitment and vows. Do you not know that those of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. This is Daniel Watson. Daniel, today do you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And is your baptism a symbol of your new life in Christ? Yes. Hear the pledge of your family of faith. In obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and on your personal faith in Him, I baptize you, Daniel Watson, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a glorious day it is, and how thankful we are that we can come together in your name and worship you. There truly is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. And will you help us as we worship together, that we'll have open minds and hearts to receive the message that you would have us to receive to go out and to be a better Christian this week. We're truly thankful for this one who has accepted you as his personal savior. Do be with him, do be with his parents, and do help him to grow in spirit and in truth. And now as we wait before you, be with our pastor. Undergird him with strength and with the words that you would have him say. And Father, we're so thankful for the prayer that you taught us to pray. And as we say these words this morning together, would you help us to hide them in our hearts so that they, those words will help us in days to come. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Jesus' command to us was to go and to baptize those who believe in his name. Our first step in following is to follow our Lord in baptism, and we have this morning celebrated in the baptism of Daniel. Well, we were reminded that that baptism is only a first step because we are to follow beyond that moment. We are to follow wherever the Master leads us. We sing together a hymn of commitment, number 285, 
And we pray together as we sing and commit ourselves by saying, wherever he leads, I will go. Let's stand together as we sing. come to the fifth and the final Sunday in the Lenten season. Our journey to Jerusalem with Jesus is almost complete. Each week we have read together a prayer of confession and today we jointly confess that often it is difficult to put action to those words. Wherever he leads I'll go. So often the leadership of God takes us places we would rather not go. And this morning we confess our difficulty at times in living out those words. Will you join me as we read together this morning's Lenten prayer of confession? Forgive us, O Lord, for we have sinned. You have called us to confession but we'd rather offer excuses. You have called us to live as new creations in the new world of your kingdom, but still we cling to the security of old lives and familiar lands. Your call is difficult and challenging, and we confess, O oh Lord, that it is hard to hear and follow. And yet, only in your love are we made whole. Only in your life do we find our lives. Only by following you can we be all that we were created to be. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and open our ears to hear your calling, our hearts to receive your grace.
By your love, renew us. By your power, transform us. By your grace, forgive us. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. We prepare now to come together to the Lord's table. And as we do so, we sing a hymn to cause us to reflect and to remember what the table and the fellowship we share there is all about. Number 368, let's stand together as we sing. Heavenly Father, truly by your love, renew us. By your power, transform us. And help us to be the Christians that we need to be. Help us to be loyal. Help us to be mindful of those about us who do not know you as their personal Savior. And help us, most of all, to live the example that you would have us live. Help us to never doubt your goodness, even when our trials seem beyond our understanding. Help us to trust you, to give us perfect gifts of love and patience and understanding. Thank you. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out onto the Mount of Olives. As we come to the Lord's Supper today, I thought it would be beneficial to us to think about all the many words and phrases that we use to describe the Lord's Supper. Many times we refer to the Lord's Supper as the breaking of bread. The breaking of the bread, it tells us about fellowship. When we think of breaking the bread, we are reminded of an intimate dinner at a friend's home. To the ancients, the dinner table was a place of intimacy. It was a place of acceptance. And when we speak of the Lord's Supper as the breaking of bread, we are reminded that we have an intimacy with God and we have an intimacy with those who surround the table. Breaking of the bread is a wonderful way to describe the Lord's Supper. Another word we use is communion. This word comes with the idea of fellowship of participation with God and participation with others. In communion, we speak of somewhat of a mystery in this participation. Paul talked about participating in Christ's sufferings and participating in his glory. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we break participation in the body of Christ? Paul speaks of communion. We are reminded as we come to the Lord's table that we have communion. We have participation with God and with those who surround the table. A third word is Eucharist. It's a transliteration of the Greek word for giving thanks. And surely the Lord's Supper is a place to come and give thanks. This table is a place that we are reminded of the sacrifice of Christ. When we drink of the cup and eat of the bread, we are reminded of the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus that he laid down his life and it was not taken from him, that his blood is our atonement for sin. We come giving thanks. This is the table of which to give thanksgiving. But there's a fourth word that we use to describe the Lord's Supper, and that's what I want us to think about this morning. That word is sacrament. Sacrament's a word that in evangelical Christianity we shy away from. We shy away from it because... In Roman Catholic use, sacrament has a sort of magical, mystical element. They believe that in the ordinances, in the sacraments of the baptism and sacraments of the Lord's Supper, that in that participation, some type of magical, mystical experience occurs. And yet, that's not what the word really means. That comes from translating the word from Greek to Latin. The Latin word for sacrament is mysterion, so you can understand how they got this idea of a mysterious element. But in the original Greek, the idea of sacrament is an outward and visible expression of an inward spiritual reality. This morning, we participate in two ordinances that reveal that meaning to us. Baptism is a beautiful sacrament, an outward expression of an inward reality. We believe, and rightly so, that baptism cannot save you. That if unless there's a commitment in one's heart to Jesus Christ and there's faith there, the only thing baptism will do is get you wet. But if someone's made a commitment of their life to Christ, if someone has passed from old life to new life in Christ, then baptism becomes this beautiful sacrament, this beautiful outward expression that when we immerse someone, they die to their old self and they are raised to new life, that they identify with the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a wonderful sacrament. 
and so is the Lord's Supper. The eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup. They do not bestow any magical, mystical power unless that power is already evident in one's heart and one's life. We come and we drink of this cup and we eat of this bread and they remind us of something very sacred and reverent. They remind us of the death of God. They remind us of the transforming power of Christ. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, we should come with reverence. This is a sacred moment this sacrament. It's not a moment to have your young children taste grape juice and unleavened bread. It's not a moment to be thinking about what's happening after church or next week. This is a moment of reverence. It is a time to reflect on our lives, a time to let the Holy Spirit illumine our sins within us and confess those sins and receive forgiveness as we come to the Lord's table. This is a beautiful sacrament, not because the bread and the cup have any mystical power, but because what they symbolize is eternal. A sacrament's the taking of the ordinary and making it extraordinary. We have sacraments all around us. The American flag is but a piece of cloth with red, white, and blue uh, involved in that piece of cloth and sewn together in a certain way. We can use those same colors in something we wear or some rag at home and it means nothing to us. But take that same color scheme and place it in the same configuration as the flag and have it raised at the National Cemetery in Washington by a color guard and it stirs your soul. Our wedding bands. This was my father's wedding band. When he passed away, my mother put it away and when it came time for my wedding day, she gave it to me. It's pretty thin, really. It's wearing thin after two marriages. If I had to pawn it for some type of money, I wouldn't get much for it. Maybe $50, maybe $100 at best if I was shrewd in my dealing. But yet it has really no value. That is, no value can be placed upon it because of what it symbolizes. The commitments made, the vows that were given, the life that is shared, the love that is shared, it is beyond value. And so it is with the Lord's Supper. Jesus took the most common elements on the Jewish table, the wine and the bread, common and ordinary, and he gave them eternal meaning. Not because they bestow some magical power, but because Christ was poured out for us. And we are reminded today that God is still in the business of taking the ordinary and making it extraordinary. There's a story about a sculpture that was unearthed by an archaeological dig in the 1870s and when it was discovered in the ancient city of Nineveh it was taken back to England and it was given to a financial backer of the archaeological dig. This rich financial backer took the sculpture to his country estate and built a wall and placed the sculpture within that wall and in the scheme of that wall. A few years later the country estate was sold to become a boys school and it, they built a gymnasium using that wall and a recreation area. And so that sculpture was part of their gymnasium. It was painted upon over and over and over again. About 1950, some so-called experts came and looked at the sculpture, and they declared that it was, was of no value. It was a useless piece of art. But just recently, an American professor saw that same sculpture, did his research, and discovered that it was authentic from the city of Nineveh. This school that was financially strapped sold this sculpture recently at auction for $15 million. The world does not know the value of things. They don't know the value of grace and faith and integrity and family and the individual. But the Lord's Supper reminds us that God knows your value and my value, that we are not worthless people that God knows the value of his creation. We are not ordinary people imprisoned in some temporal existence, but when we enter into Christ through faith, we become extraordinary people created for eternity. In the wine and in the bread, Jesus took the ordinary and gave it eternal meaning. And when he comes into our lives, he takes ordinary lives and transforms them by his grace. Sacrament, it means to take something ordinary and give it eternal meaning. 
It means one other thing. It means loyalty. In the Roman world, the soldiers would take their oath of loyalty and allegiance to the emperor, and it was called their sacramentum. It was a way that they declared their loyalty and allegiance to the emperor. And the Lord's table is a place for our allegiance and loyalty. This morning, when we partake of the bread and of the cup, we remind ourselves that we are allegiant to the Lord, that someone has laid claim to our lives by his death and resurrection. We come this day, and in a very simple way, we declare the ancient creed of the Christian, Jesus is Lord. And it has an ethical meaning for us. It has a meaning of faith, but that faith leads us to an ethical meaning of obedience. When we come to this table, we exclaim our faith, and then we also pledge our loyalty and our obedience to Christ. We are reminded of the cross of Christ, and it challenges us to take up our own cross. Let me ask you this morning, where is your loyalty? Who has your allegiance? Is it to yourself, your career, your pleasure, your status? Does the Lord call us to something more? I believe so. I believe he calls us to allegiance. And this is the place to proclaim our loyalty to a God who's taken our ordinary lives and transformed them by his grace. This is the place of allegiance. This, the Lord's table, it's our sacramentum. Bow with me for a moment. As we pause to reflect on our own lives, let me issue this invitation to the Lord's table. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to testify your righteousness, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his disciple. Come not because your goodness gives you the right to come, but come because your frailty and sin, you need heaven's help and heaven's mercy. Come because you love the Lord a little and you want to love him more. Come because he first loved you and gave himself for you. Lift up your hearts above your cares and above your fears and let this bread and wine be a sign of God's grace to you. And may this be a place that you pledge your loyalty to our Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to the table of our Lord.
as often as you eat the bread and drink of the cup, do this in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks to our God for the body and the blood of Christ. God, as we come to you today, we have no way to offer any type of ability to claim your forgiveness. But we come before you with grateful hearts. We come knowing that we were unworthy, but that Christ came for us. We come astounded that you would send your only son to die for us. What a great sacrifice has been given. Lord, forgive us when we do not recognize what you have done for us. Let us vow today to follow you and to offer our lives as a payment for what you have given us. Out of devotion, we come this day to be reminded of your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave it to his disciples.
writer Isaiah reminds us that he was pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The body of Christ, take, eat. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. This is the cup of Christ. Drink ye all of it. Scripture tells us that when they had finished, they went out to the Mount of Olives singing a hymn. We're going to sing a hymn of coming in, coming into the kingdom. Today, would you let Christ take an ordinary life and transform it by His grace? Let God give you eternal meaning. May your life become a sacrament, a visible expression of an inward reality. This is your moment to respond to Christ today. Come professing Him as Savior and Lord, rededicating your life. Come and become a part of this fellowship by transferring your letter, by baptism, by statement of faith. I'll be at the front as we sing. Let's stand and sing. Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenged to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city, and we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesboro. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are one in the bond of love.
Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning as we've come to worship our Lord together. Let me call your attention to a few of our announcements that you find on the back of your order of worship this morning. A very busy afternoon here at the church beginning at 4 o'clock. We're having an Easter egg hunt and hot dog supper for our preschoolers and children tonight. It's at 4 o'clock. You can come and they'll be meeting here at the church and having this wonderful time of fellowship. At 4 o'clock we also need the adult choir. I'm going to turn around and tell them. The adult choir here at 4 o'clock uh, this evening and uh, they'll be having their final time of uh, preparing for this evening's uh, cantata. The cantata is at 6 p.m. Uh, Hallelujah for the Cross and it will be here in the sanctuary. We invite you all to come back tonight and enjoy this time of special worship and music with our sanctuary choir. Also please look at the other announcements for this coming Holy Week. Uh, on Tuesday we are taking our senior adults to the Dogwood Arts Festival. We'll be leaving at 9 o'clock. We have 16 individuals signed up so far, but with these two new vans, we have room for more. If you have signed up, if you have not signed up, we hope that you'll take the time to do that and, or just show up Tuesday morning at 9 and join us for this time of fellowship. Please note that there will be no uh, services Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, the sanctuary choir will rehearse, but no other activities that evening. Then Thursday night, here in the sanctuary, we will have our Monday Thursday communion service. This is a candlelight service, a time of great reverence and remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we we'll hope that you will be here this coming Thursday evening at 7. And then Friday at 1130, we're going to have our Good Friday luncheon and service in the fellowship hall. Uh, the luncheon begins at 1130. And the time of service will be 12.15 to 12.45, and you'll be done in time to return to work. So we encourage you to come for this time of special services. Then notice next Sunday morning, Easter sunrise service, this year in Centennial Park at 7 a.m., and then, of course, our Easter services next Sunday morning. Please make note of the other announcements that you find there in your bulletin. It's my privilege this morning to welcome you to worship. I especially want to welcome you if you're one of our guests. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad that you chose to worship at First Baptist Church this morning. And we hope that you'll take the time to fill out a visitor's card that you find in the pew rack in front of you and to place it in the offering plate a little later in the service so that we could have a record of your visit with us this morning. This morning as we celebrate this Palm Sunday and we look down this Holy Week toward Monday Thursday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Surely our Lord is a great Lord, a God of love, and deserves our praise and our honor. This morning I want to ask you to stand and greet one another and then join together in praising our risen Lord.
Christ who came so long ago to your people. The little children ran before you. The people waved palms and lined your path as you came to them. And they shouted their words of praise, their hosannas. This morning as we remember that day, we come to you with our shouts of praise, attempting the best we can to prepare the way for you in our lives. It is our prayer in this hour that you will accept our praise as you come to us through your Holy Spirit to renew us and remake us and to show us anew of your great and endless love. Continue to create and recreate your image in us. And continue to lead us and to teach us how to be your people, even as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Thank you, youth, for sharing with us this morning. And thank you, Becky, for the work you're doing with them and the many hours that all of them have put in in rehearsing for today to bless us this morning. Palm Sunday marks an ending and also a beginning. It is the ending of the Lenten season and the beginning of the week we have called Holy Week, the week in which we remember the last week of Jesus' life on this earth, the last seven days. And so we draw closer still to the weekend, the day and the hour when all of the world was changed forever. The reason that Christ came is the death on the cross and the resurrection on Easter morning. And we journey with Christ through these 40 days and now through this last week as we draw near to Jerusalem, to the place where it all happened. Will you join me again this morning as we read together our prayer of confession? Almighty and merciful Lord, we confess our sins. We have spoken when it was a time for silence. We have remained silent when you have called us to speak. We have acted when it was time to wait. We have remained still when you have called us to action. We have wasted your blessings when it was a time to keep. We have hoarded your blessings when you have called us to share. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and by your love renew us. By your power transform us. By your grace forgive us. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Christ gave so much for us, and though we try, we could never do enough to repay all that Christ did for us. No matter what we do, Christ always has done much more than we could ever accomplish or could ever give. And yet we are reminded that in our giving, though it would never be enough, we still give, and we give our best as a way of, to, to begin to show our thanks and our gratitude for the love that God showed to us. We sing a hymn of stewardship, number 607, that reminds us of that dying, endless love that God gave to us on the cross and how it compels us to give our best. Hymn number 607, Something for Thee. Let's stand as we sing.
pause at this time to offer our gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. Let me remind you that we are taking our Annie Armstrong home missions offering this month. As of Wednesday night, we were well over $2,000 toward our $3,000 goal. If you have not given to this offering, you can do so all month long as you help others to know of God's love. Let's pray together. God, on this day, we are reminded that the same ones who sang Hosanna cried out, crucify him. How easily, Lord, we fall away. How easily we forget what you do for us. And so this day, as we look toward the cross, as we think of your great extravagant gift, we are reminded that you call us to give of ourselves, of our finances, of our energy, of our lives. And we pray that as we give, you will bless and use. In Jesus' name, amen. scripture lesson this morning comes from the gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter and the first nine verses. Let us give our best attention to the reading of God's word. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. 
while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. As he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
city of Jerusalem was alive with activity. Just two days. Two days to go to the Passover. It was the most excitable time to be in the city. And we find Jesus in the home of Simon the leper there enjoying a meal with friends, reclining at the table. And into the room walks a woman. We're told in the other Gospels that this woman was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, the one who sat at the feet of Jesus and adored him and listened to him. Jesus was her life. And she enters the room and she is carrying with her a large alabaster vase filled with perfume. And she walks into the room and breaks the vase and pours the perfume over the head of our Lord. It was customary to give a visitor a drop of perfume, a small amount when they, had, when they were visiting your home, but she broke the vase. She poured it all out. Can you picture the scene for a moment? The perfume pouring over the head and down the beard and onto the robe of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you smell that fragrance? So much perfume. It was going to be with him for a long time. It permeated every nook and cranny of that small house. She just poured it all out. And everybody's shocked. Some people are upset. Some are angry. Some are shocked because a woman has come into the room where the men were reclining and eating. Some are shocked because this same woman has let her hair down in public. A despicable act. Others are shocked at the cost to pour it all out, to give just a little bit acceptable, but she just poured it all out. It's been wasted. It's all over the ground. It's all over Jesus. It could have been sold and given to the poor. They're all amazed, all except Jesus. Jesus understands. He understands her act of love. He understands her act of devotion. He understands because she is preparing him for his own burial. He understands her extravagant act of love because, you see, Jesus was moving toward an extravagant act of love himself. Today, as we stand on Palm Sunday and we look toward Holy Week, we look toward the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday, we look at the cross on Good Friday and ahead to the great hope of the resurrection on Easter Sunday, I want us to think for just a moment about this extravagant act and God's extravagant act toward us on the cross and how it calls for us to give extravagantly. It calls for us to have acts of love. Let's look at her act for a moment. First of all, it was an extravagant act because it was risky. This woman took a risk. In her society, she was unwanted where the men were. She was not accepted in that room. She had her place. She would go in and she would feed the men their meal and she would return to the back of the house and eat her meal. She was not wanted there. And yet she walks in with no regard for societal boundaries or what others were thinking, what kind of a scandal could occur. She just walked right in and took the risk. You see, the only thing she was worried about was loving her Lord Jesus and devoting herself to him and presenting him with this great act of love. Faith calls for risks. It's always been that way. When we look in scripture, we see people one after the other who risked themselves for God. Abraham, comfortable in life, old and aged, pull up your tents, Abraham, and go to a place you know not of. Take a risk. Moses is a shepherd, a lonely shepherd. I want you, Moses, to go stand before the Pharaoh, the king, the most powerful person in civilization, and tell him to let my people go. There's a great risk. Little David, can you see him? Casting off the armor that Saul wanted to give to him. I don't want that armor. I want two smooth stones. And looking up to the giant Goliath, you don't think there was a risk? Daniel would not eat the food. He would not bow down to the king's image. He took a risk 
found himself on his knees in the lion's den. John the Baptist would say, Herod, you are an adulterer. You are a sinner. It would cost him his life. He took a risk. And throughout the history of the church, one after the other, martyr after martyr, theologian after theologian stood and said, this is where I stand. I'm taking the risk of faith. When you and I give extravagantly of our lives, it means we must risk faith. For us, the risks may be more subtle. It risks maybe being out of step with the rest of society. It may mean risking being called somewhat of a cave dweller to believe the words of an ancient book are inspired, taking risks. Kids, it may mean being snubbed at school, taking a risk. It may be, mean to be ridiculed at work, but faith takes risks. And the gift of this woman was an extravagant gift because it was risky. And yet so many times we calculate our gifts to God. What's enough service? What's enough tithing? What's enough time? How can I appease this God so I can get on with the rest of my life? That never came to Mary's mind. She came in and she broke the vase. She gave all she had. She took the risk. And to be people of faith and to give extravagantly means we take those same types of risks. This, my friends, is a time for extravagance. This was an extravagant gift because it was costly. The perfume described here is of great value. She carried it in an alabaster jar and it was perfume of nard we know that it was of great value. The scripture says it was worth 300 denarii. Now, that's not necessarily a certain, uh, the denarii is not necessarily a certain amount of money, but a day's wage. What they're talking about is 300 days' wages, almost a year's worth of money. If you go to Belks or to Pennies or to somewhere and ask them about their perfume, I did this a few years ago, and asked them how much their perfume costs, what was their most expensive item. They looked at me a little odd, but, but they, uh, anyway, $210 an ounce was their most expensive item. And we know this alabaster jar was maybe 20 times the size of an ounce. She just poured it out. A year's wage, what is that to you? 10,000, 15,000, 30,000, 50,000, 75,000? What is a year's wage? What is this being poured out onto Jesus' head? What is that value to you? There were those there that say it's being wasted. It's being poured out. And yet she gave this costly, extravagant gift. Have you ever received those gifts at Christmas or your birthday that you don't know what to do with? You know what I'm talking about. Those ties that light up or those uh, little knickknacks that you would never set out in your house or, uh, or whatever they might be. They fill your closets and your attics. You try to get rid of them every garage sale. At Christmas, you take them to those parties where you switch presents, and somehow you always get your own present and you have to bring it home. You can't get rid of those things. You know what we say about gifts like that? What do we say? It's not the gift that counts. It's the thought. It's the thought that counts. When she brought in this vase and broke it, I want you to know something. It was the gift that counted. She could have brought just a little. She could have had good intentions, but it was the gift that counted. And you and I can waste our lives serving the Lord with good intentions. But my friends, it's the gift that counts in serving God. And it's not that the gift is worth a certain amount of money. It has to do with value. Jesus and his disciples were watching them take the offering one day in the synagogue, and the Pharisees were lining up, and they were walking through and dropping in large amounts of money, one after the other. And here came a little widow woman. She dropped in her two mites, two pennies, nothing. And Jesus said, she has given the greatest gift. What? Can you hear the disciples? She gave the greatest gift. 
You can't buy two vans with two pennies. You can't pave a parking lot with a mite. You can't underwrite a budget with that type of gift. What did Jesus say? She gave out of her poverty. They gave out of their wealth. She gave all that she had. She gave extravagantly. And that's what we're called to do, to give. And it's costly to give of ourselves, to give of our energy, to give of our lives. To give extravagantly means that we give something of great value, something that costs us. She just poured it out. And this is a time for extravagance. Thirdly, it was an extravagant gift because it was spontaneous. It wasn't planned. She just seized the moment. Don't you love spontaneous moments? Women, don't you love it when you're walking down the street and your husband of 30 years still reaches over and grabs your hand? Men, don't you love it when your wife comes and gives you a kiss and shows affection for nothing? Spontaneity. Some of the greatest times with our children are those times when we're driving down the road and there's a carnival at Walmart and we haven't planned to go there, but we pull over and we buy tickets and we have a great evening. Those spontaneous moments, those are the moments we remember. Those are the moments that we cherish. Spontaneous times. I don't know whether she knew Jesus was on his way to the cross or not. The scripture is not fully plain as far as that's concerned. But she knew something. She knew this was her moment to show her love to God. And she seized the opportunity. She was spontaneous in her action. And she showed her devotion to God. And too many times we live our lives with those terrible words, I wish I had. The husband says to the wife that's divorcing him, I wish I had loved her more. The parents say to the children that are rebelling, I wish I'd spent time with them. We say to those that we stand at the canyon of death with, I wish I'd have spent more time with them. I wish I'd have shared Christ with them. I wish I had shared my life with them. I wish I had. This gift is extravagant because she seized the moment of opportunity. She was spontaneous in her action. And God surrounds us with opportunities to share Christ and to touch lives. And we miss them. And this is a time for extravagance. The fourth reason this was extravagant because it was lasting. Can you imagine the smell of this perfume? I mean, you're talking about a big jar being poured over Jesus. It was lasting. Wherever Jesus went, even to the cross, I'd say you could probably smell that perfume. It probably made it through the scourging, and through carrying the cross, and through the thorns on his head, and through the bleeding, through the sweating. You could still smell that perfume. It was a lasting gift. One writer says that even those who gambled for his clothing at the foot of the cross could smell this perfume. It was lasting not just because of its smell, but because of what it did in the heart of our Lord. Jesus said that wherever the gospel was preached, this woman's act of extravagance, this act of love, would be proclaimed and be remembered. You and I will do a lot in our lives. We have a lot of tasks that we're going to perform, a lot of things that we're going to do. But the truth is, what we do in devotion to Christ, that's what lasts. Those acts of extravagance, those acts of love, that's what is lasting. You and I are much like those, this alabaster jar. Within us, there's something beautiful. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, church, and it cries to be let out. And a world that surrounds us is dying in their sin, hurting, lonely, and heartache, looking for forgiveness and hope and love. And we have the gift to give them. Listen to how one writer puts it. Christians file into church on Sunday mornings. One by one they march in, each like alabaster jars, contained, self-sufficient, encased, individually complete, contents undisclosed, perfume not emitting. They are pretty vases, and we are vase conscious. We're conscious of our vases. In fact, we spend most of the time before worship and after worship talking about our vases and how pretty they are. And yet Mary breaks her vase. And when she breaks it, the natural thing happens. It all pours out. And she realizes she can never recapture her wonderful, expensive perfume 
again, but she lets it pour out. It's time we break our bases. It's time we take risks of faith. It's time we give our all, seize our opportunities for ministry. It's time we focus on those things that are lasting, not those things which are fleeting, and share Christ with those around us. This is a time for extravagance. I want to speak to you this morning, pastor to people, part of this church. When I thought about what Mary had done, and I think about the two words, broken and poured out. And last week we talked in the Lord's Supper that Jesus said, this is my body, what? Broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Maybe we need to embrace those two words. Maybe we need to embrace the word broken. Pride, stubborn pride that would cause us not to serve our Lord. It needs to be broken. Priorities. Priorities that don't need to be rearranged and rethought. They need to be broken. When Jesus talked of discipleship, he did not talk about rethinking your priorities, getting your life together. He talked about carrying your cross. Paul says it's like dying to yourself, broken and poured out. There are those today who need to, for the first time, be broken and poured out. To let this Christ who gave his life for you come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, and enable you to serve him throughout your life, to give you the great gift of eternal life. You have every good intention to do that. You've been thinking about that, but it's the gift that counts. It's the moment of faith. It's taking that step of faith that matters. Others are here today. You're not a part of this fellowship. And you know that God has led you to this place. And until you move that letter, follow the Lord in baptism, make that statement of faith, you know that you're not going to be able to serve the Lord as he wants you to. You have every good intention. It's the step of faith that counts. Church, this is a time to be broken and poured out. Nineteen months ago, when I came here, God blessed me. And I knew it was a blessing to become a part of this fellowship and this people. And God has blessed us beyond our dreams and beyond what we would have reasoned. But we cannot grow weary doing good. I am convinced 19 months later as I was, the first day I stood in this pulpit, that God is calling this church and this fellowship to take risks of faith. To not count the cost of service, but to give yourself completely. To take advantage of the many opportunities of ministry that surround us in our community. To pour ourselves out. To do something lasting with our lives. Listen to me this holy week. Listen to those words. Today, would you be broken? Would you pour yourself out for Christ was broken and poured out for you? This is a time for extravagance. Let's pray together. God, your word cuts to our heart as we see one who loved you fully. We realize that we withhold our love so often and we pray for forgiveness. Lord, teach us to love you as you have loved us. Teach us to love others as you love us and love them. And on this day, Lord, whatever it is that holds us back from giving ourselves completely to you, we pray that it would be broken. And we pray that we might pour our lives out, that you might pour yourself into us and live through us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we will stand and sing a hymn of commitment. If you're here today and you need to make a public decision, this is your moment. Come professing Christ. Come making a recommitment of yourself to Christ and to his church. Come and become a part of this fellowship. 
I'll be at the front as you come. Let's stand and sing. Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenged to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city and we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesboro. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's good to see you here this morning. Next week, of course, is one of our biggest mornings of worship of the year. Take advantage of that. There are people who will come and worship with you on Easter who will not come any other time during the year. This week, everyone, think of those who are unchurched. Think of those who need the touch of Christ, who you're involved with, and invite them to join you for worship next week. I hope to see all of you in our time of worship throughout this holy week and as we leave this place let us focus our eyes on the one who was broken and poured out for us let's pray together God as we leave this place we know that you have given us new life in Christ by the cross and this week as we move toward the cross we realize that it is our sin which placed Jesus there but Lord although we are repentant of our sin we are grateful for your extravagant gift in Jesus' name, amen.
have to pay for them this week. When you come for your appointment, you'll also go view your portraits and you will pay and order your extra pictures all at the same time. One trip does it all. They take all major credit cards, I think, and checks. So <laughs> please make note of that. We just don't want anybody coming saying, I didn't know that. So if you want some extra pictures, you want to be prepared to pay for those this coming week. Vacation Bible School, June 20th through 24th. We still need a few more workers. And if you've not registered your children and youth for this event, you can do so today in the nursery area as you leave this morning. And then next week, there'll be some registration forms in the bulletin for you to fill out and turn in. Let's stand now and have our benediction and sing our parting song. God, as we go from this place, remind us that we have come to worship as your people and as a people together. But as we leave here, let us realize that each day is a day for worship, that we can worship with our own lives everywhere that we are at. Amen.